Hey, this is Mr. Smalley, and I'm coming at you from the jungle exhibit at my local zoo. And what I want to talk to you about today is uh, these different regions of the Earth. So when we travel from the North Pole down to the equator, why is it that we find these different regions? So um, let's take a closer look at that today as we get into our study of biomes. Okay, so in order to get into our understanding of how our Earth works, we really have to understand a little bit more context about where Earth is. We're really located in the back corner of the universe. There's nothing that special about where Earth is. Um, and we're located around what is really a tiny little uh, yellow star, um, as far as stars go. And every second, fusion events are taking place within the center of the sun, which are fusing um, hydrogen atoms together into forming helium. And that event actually is able to send an incredible amount of energy across this expanse of space, which is 93 million miles. Um, so uh, eight minutes ago, if, if you look outside and see the sun, eight minutes ago, a fusion event took place inside the center of the sun, and it's spewing an incredible amount of energy to the earth. So in fact, there's so much energy that hits the earth every day that it could supply all of our needs for energy all across the earth. The other important thing to note about the earth is, as you can see here, um, it's a little bit off. That is, it's tilted. Uh, couple degrees to the side of where it, it looks like it might normally need to be. Um, the Earth rotates about 23 degrees off um, the axis of uh, where it orbits around the Sun. So um, that's a little bit complicated to understand, but um, essentially we're just off um, a little bit, which isn't that surprising if you think about the Earth. We're just off a little bit. Um, and this is going to help us to understand a couple of things about seasons um, once we get into that a little more. But first of all, let's take a look at the biosphere. The biosphere is going to be the Earth. Uh, bio means living. Sphere is a 3D shape. And so uh, this is the largest level you can study ecology at. Um, and if we look at our biosphere, our atmosphere is made up about 78% of nitrogen gas. That's a great thing because nitrogen gas isn't very reactive and corrosive. 20% um, of it is made up of oxygen, which is also a great thing in case you're uh, ever trying to breathe. Um, and there's about a little bit a little bit more than 1% is made up of other types of gases, including greenhouse gases and um, some rarer gases than that. Let's take a closer look at one of those important gases which I'm sure you've heard about, uh, carbon dioxide. This graph shows how the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere is changing as uh, time increases. So each year at a observatory in Mauna Loa, the, that's in Hawaii, they are measuring the amount of carbon dioxide that is in the atmosphere. And as you can see, it's increasing. So um, this is sort of a zoomed in look at um, the amount of carbon dioxide over this period of time. Um, but you can see it is increasing. The other thing that's really curious, um, and I want to ask this question and see if you can figure it out. Um, as we look here from 1970, um, so there's one point um, in the um, summer of 1970, and then the winter, summer, winter, summer, winter, summer, winter, summer, winter. Um, and as time progresses through, um, we can look at every, f there's been five years that have gone by. And there's five high points at which there's a significant amount of carbon dioxide and there's also five low points at which the amount of carbon dioxide goes um, down. And so this is over a course of a year, um, there's a high point of carbon dioxide and there's a low point of carbon dioxide. So the question is, 
Why is that happening? So I want you to think about that. I'm going to answer it later on in the video, but if you have any good ideas, um, you can pause it real quick and um, enter them in, in in the comment section below. Well, let's go ahead and get into a closer look at our biomes, which is really what this is about. Today what I want to talk to you about is um, these large regions that are characterized by a specific type of climate as well as plant and animal communities. So in each example of the biome, I want to talk about um, the climate that it has as well as plant and animal communities. And when I get into the plant and animal communities, um, I really want to touch on these things called adaptations. Adaptations are essentially ways that animals or plants uh, stay alive in their given um, climate. Now these things could be behavioral, Um, so behavioral adaptations could be things like herding or fighting. Um, they could also be physical. And that would just describe the physical attributes that make up a particular organism, and the way it looks, um, and the things that are true about its body. So let's look at the different types of biomes I'm going to go over. Um, I'm going to start out up high, in the high latitudes, polar the tundra. I'm going to cover this huge forest called the taiga. Um, over in the states we call it the boreal forest. I'm going to look at temperate zones um, and that'll be the grasslands, forest, desert. I'm going to get into the tropical uh, zones where we'll study the savanna and the rainforest. I do want to include there's a lot more types of biomes that I could cover I like that about this diagram. There's a lot of detail that I could go into, um, but that would be a much longer um, lecture, and, and I don't really want to get into the specifics of every single type of biome, but I'm going to cover um, these major ones. Now, I mentioned earlier that uh, biome was characterized by a particular climate. A climate is really a function of the temperature of a specific region, as well as its average precipitation. So um, what you see here is, uh, we'll start out with precipitation. Um, biomes with small amounts of precipitation would be like a desert and arctic and alpine tundra. They're going to have very low amounts of precipitation. Uh, on our other extreme, we'd have tropical rainforests, which have an uh, incredible amount of precipitation. Um, Temperature-wise, uh, again, the coldest thing would be the Arctic or the Alpine tundra. And then um, as we get into about 15 degrees, this is uh, approximately equal to um, about 60 degrees Celsius. And 32 would be uh, about 90 degrees Celsius, or excuse me, 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so if, if you're used to using Fahrenheit. Um, at the very hottest, we'd, we'd have um, things like the desert uh, can be very hot, as well as uh, tropical rainforests. Uh, grasslands can be really, really hot. Um, the coniferous forests, that would be like the taiga or the boreal forest, um, they're going to be much cooler. Um, so on average, they're going to be about zero, so almost always frozen. Okay, let's take a look, um, starting out up top at the Arctic. I'm going to show you a graph called a climatograph um, that covers the average precipitation as well as the temperature. So we'll take a look at one of those, but keep in mind it's gonna, it should have low precipitation and a low temperature. The place we're going to go is up on the northwest side of the Hudson Bay. Um, and as we look at the climate graph for this place, it's called Rankin Inlet, you can see it has very low precipitation. This is going to be in centimeters. So on average, it's getting uh, no more than about five centimeters of snowfall a year, um, which is very little. Um, 
and then on average it's only going to have a short window of time right here where it's over zero degrees um, Celsius so that's pretty darn cold um, so you're going to have a couple of days up in the 60 in August um, but it's going to be a pretty cold uh, jaunt year round so this is, a, this is a pretty darn cold region to live in um, what you see here uh, is going to be in red it's going to be our precipitation in blue we're going to have our temperature so that's what a climate graph would look like for this region now animal adaptations there's really um, if you look here there's no plants so um, it's just too cold and there's not enough warm days to grow plants now if we look at a, a polar bear here uh, specific adaptations that this thing's going to have is going to be its thick fur. Um, it's going to have uh, padding on its feet. It has small ears so it doesn't lose too much heat. Um, it's got a lot of fat. And, um, and so this is a, a great trait to have if you live up north. Um, a lot of fat. That's also found on the seal here. So this seal is going to have uh, really, really thick, fatty blubber that covers its body and keeps it really warm um, as it's um, tooting around underneath the ice. And the other thing that um, I want to talk about is behavioral. Um, so these would both be physical adaptations, uh, but behaviorally, um, these things have some pretty cool adaptations too. So, so um, as you look at these things, you can kind of see here he, he's kind of worried. And uh, they're skittish creatures, these seals are. And that's for good reason. Um, the polar bear sometimes will actually cover up its nose like this because it knows that the only... Uh, part of its body that can actually be seen by a seal is its nose since it's black and its eyes so it will hike forward like this and wait by one of these air holes um, so this is a really cool behavior that is going to help the polar bear stay alive so you can see adaptations can be both behaviors as well as physical traits um, that help any organism to stay alive the next place I want to look is going to be the tundra up in Alaska. So let's take a look at the climate as well as some of the adaptations. Um, so the climate here you can see the temperature is going to shoot up in the summer and it will be somewhat warm and then it will uh, fall back again to a pretty low temperature in the winter. Um, since it's on the coast in the Alaskan um, area we're looking at, it does have a fair amount of rainfall. So you can see there's quite a bit of precipitation. Now both of these pictures are shown in the summer. Um, and in the summertime, you, you really wouldn't probably want to be in Alaska. Um, so this is a beautiful place. Um, unfortunately, um, when you get here, one of the things that you're going to notice is um, as the snow melts, it leaves behind these big puddles. And um, in the puddles, out comes these flies. So um, you can be enjoying your hike or something, but you're going to be covered in mosquitoes or black flies or midges. Um, it's, it's really sort of a miserable place um, in the summertime. And the other thing that you should notice is, as you look here, you see no big trees. And um, there's a reason for that. Um, trees have to have roots. And in the alpine zones, there's actually a layer of soil that never freezes. It's called uh, permafrost. Okay. Now, permafrost actually blocks off all the root growth that would accumulate from a tree and so you don't really find large trees in the tundra zone. 
Um, so those are the plants that live here. They're going to be low scrubs, mosses, and lichens, which you can see in the foreground here, growing on rocks, and uh, heather, willows, um, just very small shrubs that can grow here. Um, it is really beautiful, and, and I think I maybe should take back some about how uh, you wouldn't want to be there in the summer. You might like to go there, uh, but there are a lot of mosquitoes, so just be forewarned. So this is a caribou. Um, a caribou is a reindeer, so this is what's bringing your presents in uh, holiday season. What is cool about this guy is that um, these things uh, have these really cool physical traits of the horns, and then they have behavioral traits of herding together to um, stay safe from predators like wolves. And also, um, they migrate. They have the longest um, seasonal migration that's known to um, humans right now, overland migration. And it's thought that part of the reason they do that is to go towards the sea where there's less mosquitoes and um, who can blame them for that. So um, let's take a look now at that one thing that we had a question about earlier. We noted that every year there's an increase and decrease in the amount of carbon dioxide. So now I'm going to answer that question. In order to answer it, I want to look up north. So um, when we look up north, there's actually um, this huge, huge expanse, the largest um, biome in terms of land. Um, this is called the taiga. And the taiga, this means uh, forest in Russian. Up here we'd call it a boreal forest. It's what it's known as in Canada. And this thing is so big that it actually affects the amount of carbon dioxide that's in our atmosphere. In the winter time, it's very, very cold in the taiga. Um, there's a brief period where it gets to be about 60 to 70 degrees, um, and the days are really long in the summer, so there actually is a significant amount of growth that happens. But by and large, it's very cold. So what happens is in the winter time, um, the sunlight is going to uh, go that 93 million miles and then part of it diffracts through our atmosphere and so it's pretty cold up there and you can see here in the winter time uh, it looks really cold on these on these uh, snowy pine trees in the summertime however the sun has a more direct path and so it's actually able to warm up the um, the forest and it comes alive and while it's alive, it goes through a process called photosynthesis. And photosynthesis um, essentially is going to suck up carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So in the summertime, the amount of carbon dioxide um, in the world actually goes down. And um, it does actually give off um, oxygen too, I want to mention that. Um, but in the winter time, um, there's not very much photosynthesis taking place. These plants are frozen and uh, they're covered in snow oftentimes. And so a lot of the uh, carbon dioxide is going to stay up in the atmosphere. And that's sort of the reason why we have this fluctuation of the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. Okay, adaptations. Um, as you look at a forest here, the pine trees are covered in a thick cuticle which keeps them from getting frozen. They also have a thick sap in there that keeps them from getting frozen. They're really dark green so they can absorb a lot of light and they're evergreen. And the reason that that is a helpful adaptation is that it, um, as soon as the warm summer months come, they're already able to go through photosynthesis. Uh, the next creature I want to talk about is this guy, it's the snowshoe hare. And as you look at it, I want you to notice two things. First of all, its fur here is white, and that blends in with the snowy background. 
it actually molts in the spring and turns brown, which allows it to blend in with its background again. But the other thing I want to keep in mind is um, as this thing is passing blood up through its ears, it has these small little ears. So as it makes the circuit back um, into its heart, the heat is n as a very small amount that is actually lost through its ears since the ears are so small and covered by hair. So that's really nice because it allows it to stay warm in the winter months. We'll contrast that with another rabbit in a couple of slides. So now I want to get into the temperate zones. This is a generalized uh, temperate zone climatograph. You can see there's a fair amount of rain that we see in blue here. So in the spring, there's a, quite a bit of rain. Um, in the summer months, there's a little bit less and uh, there's increasing increasingly less rain in the winter months. Um, now there's also really cool um, seasons and really, really warm seasons. So more than any other region, the temperate regions have a wide range of uh, seasons. So we'd have our winter season, um, which is going to be quite cold. Um, so it's going to be, on average, uh, maybe just above freezing and it's going to get down to freezing. Um, we're going to have our spring and our summer um, months which maybe are going to extend up through August. Uh, so spring might actually extend a little bit later um, depending on what the groundhogs say. Um, and then we're going to have our fall. So these really have a wide range of seasons. Uh, the first one that is going to be a temperate zone that I want to look at is going to be the grasslands. So um, this is uh, western Kansas. Um, the plains here have a bunch of grass that show, that's shown and uh, one of the adaptations that these grass have is that they have really long roots. These can be about 20 feet deep um, as far as their root systems are going to go um, for the grasses. Now grasses also have um, a specific way that they go through the process of photosynthesis which allows them to grow much faster than other types of plants. So grasses are really really well um, adapted to staying alive in their environment. The other thing I want to look at is the animal life. This is a bison. Um, bison are able to stay alive even though they're so big um, because they have a considerable amount of food to feed on. Um, these things are uh, wild creatures. They're aggressive. That's one of their adaptations that's behavioral. A physical uh, trait that they have is going to just be um, their thin fur. The fur actually sheds in the um, springtime and allows them to sort of sweat off and get rid of a bunch of their heat. However, in the wintertime, it gets thick. Um, the last creature I want to look at is a groundhog or a prairie dog. Um, these creatures actually are able to burrow and um, burrowing is kind of a cool thing because um, when it's really really hot outside um, this allows them to stay underneath the ground. Um, these creatures actually also um, herd in that they build big collections of prairie dog towns where they all live together and they help one another survive in really a complex um, social system. The next temperate zone I want to look at is going to have the same sort of setup as far as temperature and precipitation go. Okay, I want to look at a temperate forest. This is an example of uh, two pictures that are taken that show the seasons of summer and fall. So as we go from summer to fall, there is a uh, 
definite change where the leaves will drop. This is called deciduous. Um, deciduous trees drop their leaves. And this is a great adaptation that helps these trees to stay alive um, because they don't expend a bunch of energy uh, trying to grow in the winter when it's really not possible to grow because it's so snowy out. Um, the next zone that I want to look at, I think you might be able to figure out um, just by this graph here. Now if we look at our amount of precipitation, it's a very, very small amount of precipitation. Um, so that should lead you to remember this is a desert. So deserts have very, very small amounts of precipitation. Um, as far as its temperature goes, uh, this is the Mojave Desert, and it really does have some seasons. Um, so it does have sort of a hotter season and then a cooler season. Um, there are different types of deserts around the world. Some of them are actually very cold. Um, I'm not going to be talking about cold deserts, but it is uh, interesting to note that you can be at places like the Gobi Desert or um, different places around the world that are quite cold. Adaptations that plants have in the desert. Um, these plants have the ability to store water, and they do that by wrapping their uh, leaves in a thick cuticle of wax. Um, that would be called like a succulent plant. Um, these Joshua trees here have very uh, short, broad leaves that actually don't get rid of much water. So um, they lose very little water through their leaves. Um, this is all across the board you find really uh, interesting leaves. That's why cactuses leaves are so reduced. Um, and these things have to hold on to their water. This is another example of a rabbit um, and you can really clearly see how adaptations would take place. Um, so as blood is traveling up through this rabbit's ears and um, it's going to return into the heart um, again. The rabbit here you can see is actually able to get rid of a lot of its heat because um, the pipes are so big you can actually see the vein in this ear. Um, it actually is able to exchange a lot of heat um, for the cooler um, air around the rabbit's ears. So this is a great adaptation for this thing to stay cool in an environment where it's really, really hot. Okay, um, finally we're going to get into the tropical zones. Uh, we'll talk about the savanna. There's a couple different types of savanna, but um, they're found in Africa. Uh, there's some in South America and over in Australia and a little bit in southern India. The one we're going to look at is in Africa. Um, you can see the temperature in red here is always quite high and the amount of precipitation, um, this is so cool, it's just it's going to spike. So this would be called monsoons. Um, and this is a very wet season that these things are going to experience. So when we look at a uh, picture of you know, the Serengeti or other savannas, uh, you see a lot of large herbivores. These things are going to be grazers. Um, they are able to do that because there's so much grassland there. And they're just like a buffalo on uh, the grasslands. They can support their huge body weight with a bunch of food. The final thing we want to look at is going to be the rainforest. The rainforests are always found at a specific region. They can't be that far from the equator. The equator is basically the central line uh, that runs through um, the earth. So we're almost done covering all the land biomes and we finally made it down to uh, tropical paradise which would be the equator. And 
uh, let's take a look at one of my favorite places. Um, be the Amazon. And so we can see the temperature and precipitation chart for this. Now they have a really uh, intense wet season down in the Amazon. Um, this is the wet season where it just rains quite a bit and then they're going to have a bleak season. So this is their dry season. And um, you can also see that the temperature, it looks like it's going to flip-flop a little bit. Um, keep in mind, this is a pretty small scale here. So it's really staying just about the same. Um, but it, it does get a little uh, hotter in the dry season. And then the wet season, when there's all that water out, it kind of cools things off. Um, but by and large, the, the rainforest stays pretty much the same uh, temperature. Um, certainly by the standards of somebody from Kansas, it stays pretty much the same. Life in the rainforest is incredible. Uh, this is a picture of me several years ago in Costa Rica and uh, there's just an incredible amount of animal life there. Uh, it's the most biodiverse place in the world. But um, unfortunately for me, um, I'm only able to study the bottom layer here. So there's a couple different layers that you could look at this at. Um, the very the bottommost layer is going to be called the understory, um, and then the very top is called the canopy. And um, so there's a lot of different types of plants that can grow here. The trees can be very very tall. Um, one thing I want to highlight here is a bromeliad. This is an example of an epiphyte. Uh, epi means above and phyte is plant. So these things actually grow on trees and um, you can see them all over the place. There's things like orchids and ferns that um, just sprout up on an already living tree. Um, so pretty much everywhere you look, it's covered in life. Um, they're really, really neat parts of the world, and um, I hope that you get the chance to go there and go to many different regions of the world and explore all the cool biomes that there are. So I appreciate you guys tuning in for this video tutorial, and um, good luck in your travels in life.